Ed Reardon's Week by Christopher Douglas and Andrew Nichols. Episode 2, Pulp Non-Fiction. Monday. It isn't generally realised that being a writer is probably one of the most dangerous professions around. Not only is there the psychological damage of a friend's book being favourably reviewed by Fatty on front row, by Fatty in the following day's Guardian, and then Fatty again on late Fatty review for Fat Fatties. Hello, everybody. It's me again with a funny voice. Oh, pass the cakes, Jermaine. Mmm, yum, 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 No. There's a daunting abundance of physical risks as well. Sunstroke from falling asleep on a park bench while trying to unblock a narrative line, for example. And now, of course, there's a new affliction sweeping through the ranks of scribblers, repetitive strain injury. Some of our younger novelists are especially prone to it, sitting all day at the keyboard, continually pressing the function key for insert reference to 1970s TV show or pop song here. Ugh. My own condition, which necessitates frequent insertion of index finger into ice bucket, is a consequence of clicking the mouse to check my sales ranking on the Amazon website an act of melancholy masochism, especially as previous titles in the Reardon canon have long since disappeared off the radar. Just have another little looky-look. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, my God. Hello, yes? Felix, it's Ed. Look, I've just had some great news about the sales of my book. You've written a book? Charlie, well done. Clever old you. What's it about? It's pet peeves. Is it a play? No, it's a book. You did the deal. Did I? I saw an awfully good play the other night. Marvellous actress in it. What's her name? I don't know, but I I'm talking about my book, Pet Peeves. Yes? Well, you know, it's a sideways look at the famous, as told by their adorable but not always mildly spoken pets. You should do a play. She had the most corking pair of legs uh, started at her shoulders. Who did? What? Anyway, Felix, the thing is, Pet Peeves has gone up to 197th on the Amazon sales ranking. Ah, um, uh, could you just put it down there, please? <laughs> An extraordinary spaceman that has brought me a case of Gébré Chambertin. Uh, um, I've got to sign for it, do I? Felix! There you are now. Off you go, back to Mars. Felix! Yes? Look, the thing is about an Amazon sales ranking... It's an online indicator of how quickly and how many your book is selling. Oh, well, now you've lost me there. Well, look, I think you should get me on the front row, at least. Oh, way over this poor old head, I'm afraid. Pinch your man for that sort of thing. Just let me uh, transfer you on this uh, machine here. Um, hello? Uh, what have I done now? You have 123 messages. Oh, dear. Yeah. Another hazard of the writer's life is the high risk of coronary arrest brought on by a conversation with one's agent, or indeed his representative in the 21st century, Ping, one of the 12-year-olds who run his agency. And come to think of it, just about everything else in this country. But Ping, Pet Peeves is 197th on the Amazon ranking. No, 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 you don't understand. I was 123,000 yesterday. That means I, I've just worked it out. I, I've sold 122,800 pet peeves since yesterday. I mean, at this rate, I go past Lynn Truss on Thursday. No, Ed, all it means is that you've sold more copies than 122,800 other authors. No, well, that, that's fantastic, isn't it? It's good, but those authors probably haven't sold any books at all in the last 24 hours. Ha! Poor wretches. So, you see, if you <laughs> Right. So it does mean I've sold a book, then? Not necessarily. You see, it might just be an order for a book. Uh, how it works, mm. right? It's called exponentially exaggerated sensitivity, yeah? Mm. It's like a trigger mechanism, and there's no actual mechanism or trigger. No, yeah, I'm with you. Oh, God, it gets worse. I've just gone down to 453,980th. That must be close to last. Oh, I shouldn't think so. Not by a long way. Really? Well, can you find out who I'm ahead of? Get their names. Uh, well, I'm kind of really busy this morning. Well, what about the Downing Street cat book? Must be ahead of that meretricious pap. Ah, uh, 79th. Damn. Ow! Are you OK, Ed? Yeah, it's just a writing injury. <clears throat> Look, you, you're not free for lunch, are you, Ping? 
So I can jump on a train from Birkenstead, be inside you within the hour. I mean, I'd, I'd be with you inside the hour. Because I, I... Hello? Hello? Yeah, gone. Saga Radio. And in the next hour on Saga Radio Digital, what have we got? Well, we've got more from Jasmine Davis on speed dating for the over 50s. If you can stay with us, Jasmine. If you'll have me, Don. Might even set you up. <laughs> <laughs> don't know about that. More cremation do's and don'ts. And who said this? I used to be best friends with my celebrity owner till Brad came on the scene. He's the pits. Grrr. Few clues there. And that's all after this from Mr. Val Dunigan. Now Patrick McGinty, an Irishman of note, fell in for a fortune and he bought himself a goat. Tuesday. More physical punishment. Advice to budding authors, if you want to be popular without compromising your seriousness or, perish the thought, dumbing down, you have to be prepared to take on the rigours of a promotional tour. I doubt that even Olympic athletes have it this tough, on top of which they probably have someone to drive them to the stadium. Do I go through here? Yes. Uh, do you want some water or something? You're, you're sweating a bit. No, is that ridiculous train? Anyway, uh, Don's got your book. Or does he like it? Oh, he, yeah, he always likes them. Ah, the elusive Mr. Raven. That's the, uh, the train just, uh, just came to a complete That's standstill. Oh, 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 oh. Miss Paddy McGinty's gold. Well, I don't know whether Paddy McGinty, the owner of that there goat, was as famous as some of the celebrities in a lovely new book written by my next guest, Mr Ed Reardon, who's here, <laughs> a bit red in the face, but it's great to have him with us. Oh, thanks, Don. Uh, nice to be here. <clears throat> no thanks to your wonderful transport system. I mean, it must be the worst in the world. Must be. Surely not beyond the wit of man to design something that actually works. Well, well, something that very definitely does work is this smashing book of yours. So tell us about Pet Peeves. How did you come to put it together? Uh, well, publishers make you do uh, a lot of work for nothing. Then they give you a minute advance and uh, graciously allow you to go ahead with it. Right, but it's, it's well worth it in the end. Well, I hope so, yes. Um, I mean, I, I'm a novelist, really. I, I'm just doing it for the money, such as it is. Two grand. <laughs> Can't be bad. Really? I, I just hope everyone will um, go out and buy a copy. Well, you've certainly got two satisfied customers here. For anybody just joining us, the answer to the earlier quiz was raspberries. And with me in the studio are Ed Ridden, author of Pet Peeves and speed dating guru, Jasmine Davis. So, Jasmine, how would you go about getting a speed date with a celebrity's pet? Uh, I don't know. Well, that's bestiality, isn't it? That's, um, that's not really what my book's about. Marvellous stuff. And while you're pondering that, here's Mr. Matt Munro. Born free. Fantastic, guys. Oh, you really think so? How's the book doing, Ed? Uh, well, we can't grumble. It was um, 197th on Amazon this morning. Wow. Mm. It goes up and down, though, doesn't it? Mm. You can be 197 in the morning, 400,000th by lunchtime. Mm. That's what happened to my little book of weather links. I'd be better off cockle-picking than sitting here doing this. Well, that's so great, Ed. I mean, you can do both things, the serious novels and the popular stuff as well. Yeah, yes, and, and telly. It's... Uh... That's not a bad way to earn a living. Movies. So, if you'd just like to sign this copy of Pet Peeves, Ed. Oh, sure. Is it to Don? No, it's a prize for the person who got raspberries right. Oh, right. Um, is it you I see about getting my train fare back, by the way? Oh, between movies at the moment, are you? Uh, can I give you a lift anywhere, Ed? Uh, yes, if you're going anywhere near Maidstone. I'm doing Medway Towns Hospital Radio, all five at once. Oh, no, sorry. I'm going to do Woman's Hour, the other direction. Mm. Uh, actually, Don, can you check to see if my car's arrived yet? Your what? Shh. Born free. Well, you may be born free, but the cost of dying is no joke these days. And now's the time, if you haven't already, to start planning for that cremation. Two espresso. <coughs> Wednesday. Waiting for the reviews is, as any writer will tell you, an exquisite uncertainty. Noel Coward would sit up all night in Sardi's restaurant in New York until the first editions came in, concealing his nervousness behind an urbane carapace and the curling smoke of a Maurier. Hey, Antonio, where's my toast? I, for my part, continue the tradition by thumbing through the newspapers for a mention of pet peeves at Berkhamsted Public Library. 
At least it calls itself a public library. In the brave new cappuccino world, books have been relegated to the bottom of a pile of user-friendly infotainment artefacts such as videos, Christmas cards, Nintendo numbskullery and the ubiquitous internet. Daily Mail, nothing. Spectator, nope. Telegraph, uh, no. Hey, finish with that express. Not yet. Give us a page that says free cup of tea for every reader. Ah, oh, for goodness sake. Hey, be careful, Kevin, it's boiling up your face. There you are. <sighs> it takes an hour or two to get through all the newspaper polls, but I was rewarded on turning to the magazine racks with a rare nugget of praise. In this month's Caravan and Camper, a publication, I might say, with ten times the circulation of The Spectator and The New Statesman combined, Pet Peeves is described as a nice little read. The reviewer is the anonymous but highly respected Wayfarer, himself the author of the successful Pubs That Like Kids and the even more successful runaway bestseller Pubs That Don't Like Kids. Respect from one's peers is always to be treasured, if not pinned up on the fridge. Excuse me, can I have some change of the photocopy, please? Can I just direct your attention to the notice at this time, sir? Yes, I know it says no change given, but I've only got a two-pound coin. A photocopier doesn't give change either. Well, if you were to purchase a beverage or muffin from the cafeteria, we have blueberry or regular at this time. I don't want a muffin. I want a 20p. Then I'm afraid I can't help you at this time, sir. You got a pair of scissors there, Chief? Certainly, sir. I decided to put the magazine in my jacket and walk out at this time, along with a copy of the new oldie, containing a completely gratuitous attack on Nick Hornby, which was also highly photocopiable. I can't believe it's not fiction. <laughs> oh, dear. Sir? Hello, what's this? It's not for me, is it? I don't think you've had your books stamped. I'm afraid your system must have gone haywire. I haven't got any books. Would you mind opening your jacket? The no. way you're holding your arm by your side suggests that you're concealing something. This happens to be a writing injury. Nevertheless, would you mind opening your jacket at this time? No, I'm not taking my clothes off for you. If you want to apprehend a criminal, I suggest you do something about that tramp photocopying his free tea coupon. Done it about 20 times now. Stay there if you would, sir. Now, sir, sir. Wait, sir. Come back. Let's just have another little check on the sales ranking, shall we, Elgar? Hmm? Up 38,000. <laughs> oh, what's this? If you enjoyed Pet Peeves by Ed Redden, you might also like The Highway Code and the Bible. Oh, pretty august company. Let's see how the Bible's doing, shall we? Oh, dear. Bad day for the good book. Researching further by typing literary failures into Google, I came across an interesting article about the fate of what the publishing industry is pleased to pass off under the politely coy title of Remaindered Books. Remaindered, that is, in the sense that a cargo of depleted uranium or a ten-month-old sausage found in the back of the fridge is remaindered. Anyway, it used to be the case that prisoners spent their days sewing mailbags, taking degrees at the Open University. Now, it seems, they're given the job of putting unsold and, frankly, unwanted works of literature out of their misery by drilling holes in them prior to their being sent to the pulping machine. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, it's truly awful. People spend months of their lives writing these things, only to see them reduced to something resembling instant mashed potato. But you see, being a best-selling author isn't quite the picnic that some people imagine. No, but it's awfully attractive, though. Emboldened by the day's positive news, I decided to try and get some return on the £8.50 I'd been forced to pay that woman for her speed-dating book. Clearly, she had no idea about the happy Freemasonry of authors where signed complimentary copies and email addresses are exchanged over a drink after the gig. So, that evening found me dipping a speculative toe into the dating pool at Zoltan's in Station Approach, Watford, hopping from table to table in search of kindred spirits, soulmates, wealthy and desperate heiresses, call them what you will. I really like your DSOH. Sorry? dry sense of humour. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, it helps, I find. Mm. I mean, imagine what it must have been like for Geoffrey Archer when he was at Her Majesty's pleasure, being obliged to take the Black and Decker to one of his own sorry efforts. Yes. <laughs> Surely there were enough holes in the plot already. <laughs> have you read any of those things? All of them, actually. They're a great comfort to me after I lost my husband. Helped take me out of myself. 
Well, I'm, I'm sure, at time of stress, they... Uh... And if I hadn't been for Geoffrey's short stories, I don't think I could have got through being made redundant. Ah. Um... <laughs> this is your date, Master. That's ten minutes, everybody, so all change, please. Well, I'm a writer. <laughs> Sorry, is it too late to change, date, Master? I like theatre, cinema, especially 1950s cinema. Oh, yes, um, me too. I like too. pubs, having a laugh, cheap lunches. <laughs> and what Great. I don't like is bad manners, aluminium and the worm. The what? The white worm in my head that keeps making me do these awful, awful things. Um, uh, date master, excuse me, date master. Um, when you got a minute? It's barking M, this one. Thursday. A day I suppose I'm lucky to be able to greet with my... Customary 8 a.m. pipe and pint of caffeine. Who knows what would have happened if I brought White Worm Woman home. It's an aluminium coffee pot for a start. Nevertheless, the ten pounds that the speed dating experience cost me, plus the extravagant fiver on an A1 size colour photocopy of the Nick Hornby review, now presents a problem. Elgar's hungry, and so am I. And it's no good telling him that a £20 royalty cheque from the BBC was due three weeks ago. So... Plan B, but a search round the bike racks at the station for loose change fallen from the pockets of late and harassed commuters proves fruitless. Likewise, the returned coin trays and the payphones at the station, all empty. Another consequence of the damnable rise in popularity of the mobile phone. Consequently, the coffee break of my writing class, this week's topic, Sell That Blockbuster, was awaited with unusual keenness and not a little noise from the old tum. And we'll continue deconstructing Wild Swans by Jung Chang after the break. But we've only done five minutes. She's not even got married yet. I wouldn't have bothered with the love if I'd known. So, back here and watch me say 30 minutes. I think he's hungry. You hear his tummy rumbling? You should have said love. I'd have made you a sandwich. Oh, uh, what, what have you got? Rolled pork with stuffing, but you're not having one now. And you can stop looking at my crisps. Berkhamstead Leisure Centre may have lacked the lavishness of Yu Fang's wedding feast, but I fell upon the cellophane-wrapped custard creams with all the vigour of one of General Jouet's guests. However, like the aristocratic warlords of pre-revolutionary China, I little knew what ferocity was about to be visited upon me. Look at the crumbs on him. Uh, one of the side effects of writing a blockbuster is being thrust into the glare of the media. And it's like a goldfish bowl. What would you know about that? Well, I've, I've had a bit of it with um, something I've got out at the moment. I heard him on the radio. He was late. Had to apologise to Don Wade. I mean, you've got to be thick-skinned. You're going to get reviewed, and not everybody's going to like it that you're selling shed loads of books. He wasn't very good. Did you get off with that woman? What woman? Jasmine Davis. Oh, the speed dating one. She's good. I heard her on Woman's Hour. Look, if I could just have your attention for a minute. Now, what's your book about, dear? Uh, well, it's an unashamedly populist piece. I turned my hand to it about talking animals. Is that why we're doing wild swans, then? No, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that whatever kind of writer you are, you are a writer. And if you're a writer, it's you against the world. And you've got to be prepared to stand up and say, this is who I am. Doesn't matter how old you are, one of you could be the next Catherine Cookson or the new Mary Wesley. They're both dead, dear. Can I be the new Harold Robbins? You can be anyone you like. That's what I'm trying to say. As long as you're true to yourself. Excuse me, sir. Are you Mr. Raven? No. The sudden appearance of a 12-year-old policeman brought a mercifully early conclusion to my writing class. What was not so welcome was the news that I was being charged with antisocial behaviour, to wit, stealing two magazines from a public library. Oh, this is ridiculous. He didn't pay for the biscuits either. Said, He's Who got reads four. caravan and camper anyway? You're supposed to put 50p in the cup. Right. I reckon he oh. took some out. Check your CCTV footage, I would. Well, he was looking shifty when I saw him in the library. Should have shopped him. I might have got a reward. Friday. Up before the beak. Certainly born before the beak. The presiding magistrate at Birkenstead was probably the first member of the judiciary to be too young to have heard of the Beatles. You're too old to be wasting the court's time like this. Right, point taken. Can I make my speech now? No, you can pay a £20 fine plus costs, which comes to, um, how much? Uh, three pounds. I beg your pardon, ma'am, five pounds. What? It was a summer special double issue. Thank you. Twenty-five pounds and I don't want to see you again. Twenty-five pounds. No doubt a trifling sum for most people, not least my fellow miscreants the gang of children who'd smashed up Berkhamstead Town Centre. 
They paid their debt to society with crisp £50 notes, or red ladies, as they called them, while arranging on their mobiles to convene the following night for more of the same in Leighton Buzzard. So, £25 is, as I say, for most people, a trifling sum. However... Next, non-payment of fine. Ten days. Naughty. What we got here? One bunch of keys, one pipe, one box matches. We burnt one saved inside. One half packet Orbit chewing gum. Yes, there's four left, I've counted. One Sony Walkman containing one Billy Holiday cassette. One postcard from Salman Rushdie refusing help with payment of fine. Mm. Normally, such an open-handed author. Must have offended him as well as society. <laughs> uh, he's a mate, but he's got a lot of extra commitments now. And one half of a return train ticket to London, valid till Tuesday. Oh, bad luck. Sign here, please. Right. I see my room now. Saturday. Most writers worth their salt have been to prison. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Oscar Wilde, Mad Frankie Fraser. All have known what it's like to have only their thoughts for company. A glimpsed patch of sky, the only connection with the outside world. I can also see Carphone Warehouse, which gives me a head start on Solzhenitsyn, so the pressure is now on to produce a substantial piece of work, prose or verse, I'm not sure which. Oscar Wilde's Ballad of Reading Jail is an acknowledged classic, and I gather Reg Cray's Poems for Mum sold pretty well. But as the gap in this diary indicates, I've been cruelly denied the tools of my trade for a week now. No pipe, no backy or whiskey. Only a pen and a ream of A4 paper. But I suppose I shall have to make do. You see here, true hair. Felix. What? Oh, my dear fellow. Oh, absolutely wonderful to see you. Well, you too. I... Oh, I can't tell you what this means. I thought everybody had forgotten about it. Oh, certainly not. No. Uh, I, I hope I'm not stopping you um, tunnelling. No, no, no. I'm sure there is tunnelling, but I haven't signed on for the performance art module yet. So there isn't a chap underneath your chair with a fork and spoon and his trousers full of sand? Well, <laughs> look, let's get out of the day room. The uh, Saturday brunch bunch is coming on. Some of these blokes never miss a teenage show if they can help it. Johnny Bird. Well, it's been lovely to talk to you. It's just through here. Uh, we need to look at the diaries and plan next year because... Uh, there's the poetry, um, there's the prison memoirs. Oh, and there's a table tennis play I very much want to do. A two-hander, is it? Well, that's very commercial. And um, I'm in the middle of a letter to the Times about conditions in here. That it's, it's so angry. Mm. Well, I mean, they're going to have to go back to being broadsheet to fit this one in. Anyway, this is me. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, very smart indeed. Terribly grand. It's just like school, isn't it? Have you got a fag? Oh, they call them bitches here. Oh, a fag and a bitch. What a lucky old you. We must be paying you too much. No, not enough, actually, Felix. That's sort of why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, is this bowl yours too? Yes. Well, and you just put it through that little hatch, do you, and they fill it up? I, I say I could do with one of those. Yeah, you just rattle it at Fiona and, hey, presto, spotted dick. Anyway, um, I, I'll let you get on because I've got to go now and see another very clever fellow across the way. Well, so you haven't come to see me at all? Uh, not uh, primarily, no. Uh, I'm hoping to sign him up for a book. He's a cannibal. And he's advertised in the Sunday Times for volunteers to come and be eaten by him, you see. Uh, did you get much feedback? Well, a surprising amount before the forces of political correctness descended upon him and put him in here. But if he hasn't got a recipe book in him, well, I'm a Dutchman. Anyway, uh, we must have lunch, Ed. Well, it's nearly quarter past ten. They'll be serving it in a minute. Yes, well, I can see you've put on a few pounds, you lucky devil. Um, now... Uh, how do I get out of here? You just turn the handle and open the door. Oh, good Lord, call this a prison? You're living the life of bloody Riley. Sunday. I haven't yet managed to put pen to actual paper in spite of, or could that be because of, the amount of material at my disposal? Because not for the first time, Ed Reardon has been persecuted for being brighter than those in authority. The latest bone of contention was the prison newsletter, or The Wrong'un to give it its nauseatingly matey title. It contained an editorial from the governor which perpetrated so many crimes against the English language 
that I was obliged to take him to task over his use of the word hopefully in front of 200 inmates at this morning's roll call. Come on, put your backs in me, call yourself a work detail. This isn't a holiday camp, it's a recycling unit. Prisoner 567241 Reardon, what are you playing at? Get on with it. But what you're making me do is absolutely inhuman. You don't know what inhuman is, Grandad. You've only drilled a hundred books in the last half hour. I don't mind doing the Nick Hornby's, but some of these are mine. Look, what's this? Pet peeves by Ed Reardon. All right, autograph it, then drill a hole in it. I've done those 20,000 stellar innings, sir. Well done, your lordship. Into the matter with them. Come on, the rest of you. There's privileges to be earned here. Privileges? Nobody told me about them. Well, you should have read the newsletter instead of just criticising it, shouldn't you? Drill half a ton before lunch, there's a phone card in it for you. Any more than that, and you're into nectar points. Well, come on, keep them coming. I can do two pet peeves at once here. Thank God I delivered it 50 pages too short. We've got a sharp one here, Malcolm. You're right there, Neville. You've only got a better start in life. It was a sad irony, but also a felicitous one, that I was able to make more out of destroying pet peeves than I was ever likely to earn from selling it. But as I tell my students, or as I will tell my students as soon as my suspension period is over, these are the commercial realities of the life literary. Moreover, the well-merited phone card meant that I was able to update my CV with the dating agency and also collect the considerable number of replies that followed. Hello, it's Bubbly Blonde and Caring here, BBC, yeah? Um, I assume CR means you've got a criminal record and I was just wondering when we could meet. But I need to know first just how many people you've murdered before I marry you. Hello? Am I speaking to Clyde? I think I'd like to be your Bonnie. Hello, Ed. Uh, it's Jasmine Davis here. We, we met at Saga Radio. I was so sorry to hear about what happened to you, and uh, I just wondered if you needed anyone to feed your cat. <laughs> Ed Reardon's Week starred Christopher Douglas with Stephanie Cole, John Fortune, Sally Grace, Sally Hawkins, Mel Hudson, Martin Hyder, Emma Kennedy, Rita May, Jeffrey McGiven, Dan Tetzel, Alice Lowe, Vicky Pepperdine and Jeffrey Whitehead. It was written by Christopher Douglas and Andrew Nichols. The producer was Simon Nichols.